Hey guys, it's Vince. Today I'm going to discuss a solution to a problem that most of us have encountered as we try to wire our CNC controller or CNC chassis. Um, it's usually encountered when you get past that point where you're looking at, okay, I'm hooking up home switches or I'm hooking up relays or, you know, even as you go to wire your power supply, you know, depending upon what kind of breakout board you have and whatnot, you tend to run out of terminal ports, um, be it inputs, outputs, it really doesn't matter. Um, as soon as it gets to that point, you're running out of terminal ports, things get messy, and I'm about to eliminate that. Um, actually, I've, I've designed a couple of kits that will aid you in formulating what's known as a subsystem. Okay, Building electronical subsystems will keep your unit neat, whether it be a CNC or any electronical project that utilizes terminal blocks, you can use this overall anywhere virtually. I mean, the possibilities are endless, but the overall um, way to use this is to eliminate, especially with our genre of what we're using it for, is to eliminate any problems when it comes to troubleshooting. And I'll show you exactly what I'm talking about. So first I'm going to cover what we have on the table. We've got a 48 volt, 12 and a half amp power supply. Um, again, if the unit's not hooked up, it's just for visualization. Um, you do see one lead connected to the COM output port on the power supply. Over here, we've got my G540 uh, made by Gecko, which is the flagship drive that I use. Um, I love this drive. It's the best value on the market as far as I'm concerned. And this particular drive actually has the heat sinks attached with thermal epoxy. However, the thermal epoxy is still setting. Um, this is an actual customer's drive, so I'm not going to manipulate it. I just wanted to use it for cross-referencing in the video. So what we have here, you see one lead going into input one on the G540. And for those of you who don't know, the Gecko has four available inputs to be used. It's got one, two, three, and four. Now, here's a big situation where we get into where guys want to hook up home switches and find they only have available four inputs, and then they typically want to use a tool setter plate to set tool height, and that takes the fourth input, and then you're, you're done. And that's frustrating. So now I'm going to show you how to eliminate that the proper and safe way, okay? And, and in a couple ways, it solves a couple of other situations. We'll cover that in a minute. What we have here, again, is the terminal coming off the black wire. And while this might look like typical black wiring, uh, hookup wire, it's actually silicone wire. And you can see I'm, I'm not putting any pressure on this and just how flexible that is. I mean, this stuff is super, super flexible. It's the same wire I use uh, on my stepper motors, okay? It's 20, 20 AWG, and for the gecko, when you're hooking up short, actual wire runs on these really light type products like this, it's absolutely the best wire to use, especially in confined spaces. Um, I've got a piece of a sample here. Again, it's a product that will now be carried in my store. Um, you can see just how fine those conductors are, pure copper, super high quality, and just super, super flexible. So when you go to wire something, and again, we always want to use the best tool for the best job. And this is one of them tools where the job really situation justifies using something super flexible and easy to manipulate when you're in them really, really tight spots. So as we continue here, everything will all kind of justify itself as we go through. So we're now using silicone wire here. Silicone wire then breaks out into our terminal bus bar. Now a terminal bus bar, for those of you who don't know, or terminal, terminal block, you can see here it's made out of solid brass block. Um, you've got your 10 uh, terminal ports on it. You also have nylon standoffs, which are pretty simple and self-explanatory. They, they prevent the uh, actual metal from making contact with other metal, which would short the bar out, unless you're using it for a ground bar, which in that case, you could, of course, remove these standoffs and just mount the bar itself to a piece of metal as a ground bar, which is what we use typically in the U.S. On, in our breaker boxes. So for you guys who aren't aware, these have tons of uses. I love them for this application because, again, in full-scale machining, um, when I'm building full-scale machines and working on their controllers, we used to do this all the time. Um, again, what you see here, terminal bus bar, if you just look at this, this is pretty self-explanatory. You've got one input getting broken out to 10. So now what we're doing, and again, this really pertains to this switch, and again, this switch is arbitrary, guys. I just picked this switch because, again, in Gecko's wiring diagram that's been passed around on the Internet about a billion times, um, they reflect using the Gecko and then using uh, switch, uh, home or limit switches, and I prefer to say home switches because I don't believe in limit switches, 
um, limit switches should not be used, and I'll emphasize that real quick. Limit switches are not required when you use a G540 because your software has soft limits, and you should always implement your soft limits to be used because it'll be far safer than using a mechanical switch that fails. Okay? If the software fails, the worst that'll happen is the machine will stop. If your switch fails, it's going to crash. And if it crashes, the worst case scenario, or the best case scenario you're looking at is at least resetting up an axis or a machine, and then you're always going to be worried, did it do something else that I can't see yet? It's crazy. Don't take a chance. Do it right. However, for home switches, that's a different story. Home switches are really for a machine that's doing repeatable work in the same location. If you want your homing location to be dedicated to a certain area, these switches are your best friend. In that situation, when we're talking about that wiring diagram again, um, you can see they have a lot of these switches hooked up, one and then another, and, and basically to hook up two switches so that you can manipulate these ports over here, it's very, very tedious to do in the sense that you have to bridge two switches and then hook up more wiring to here, basically using everything. In this instance, what we're actually doing is we're hooking one switch up at a time because now we have all these inputs. We can hook up one switch here, and then you can see another terminal block being used here or a terminal bus bar, whichever way you'd like to call it. And again, it's a 10-port one, and you see the terminal going into our output COM on the power supply. So basically what we've done is take a single output on the power supply and break, break that out. So now you've got 10 here and you've got 10 here. So you've got 10 inputs, 10 outputs. If you needed to put on just input 1 all of your home switches, you can now do that and still have excess left over just with input 1 and still have all left over all your rest of your three inputs for whatever you choose. And I'll make this suggestion. If you use this again on any of the other inputs, you could have, I mean, basically up to 30. So you're taking this with the built-in breakout board and using this to split it properly. You will not be using daisy chaining, which again, Gecko far, highly recommends against, and so do I. And on top of that, what you're actually building is a subsystem. And what the subsystem actually is in full-scale manufacturing is the fact that if we ever had to troubleshoot this, let's say I was having trouble with my power supply and I wanted to troubleshoot exactly what's causing the issue, Again, the best way to do it is disconnect everything as simple as possible in system format. So if I only have to disconnect one wire here, I've already disconnected all my switches. So I can go back and say, okay, power supply is good, and rehook everything up in two seconds. The same opposite perspective of that is if, that, if I ever have a switch that fails, okay? Now, if you had all that, wire, if you use a wiring diagram that's provided by Gecko, uh, it's just a, a format and you see a switch solder to another switch and then run the typical way, if you have one switch fail, you've got to check two switches. In this format, being each switch is hooked up individually, you would simply unscrew here, unscrew here. Those two unscrews let you disconnect the switch, and at best case scenario, you can check the individual switch on top of the fact you'd only have two solder connections to do when you're done. It's much, much faster, it's more efficient, and it allows for quick changing and manipulation of your system without being intrusive, okay? And when I say intrusive, I want you to see here how this wire is hooked up. I'm not going to move the G540, but if you pay attention here how the wire is hooked up and how flexible this is, when this is in the system, you can mount this anywhere you'd like, which makes it convenient to manipulate your switches or hookups. You never have to disturb the drive itself, unless you had to remove it, of course, for maintenance or whatever else you're looking at. So again, this format, building a subsystem is definitely the best way to go. And again, I use the switch as an arbitrary device. You can use anything you want here and make this subsystem incorporate that item. So whatever you want to hook up, again, super easy to do. This is definitely the way to go. And again, you can manipulate to your heart's content. You can even use these again, and I'm just opening up some more ideas here. As you see me come off the output of the comm here, if I also went off an output of the positive output, you would basically have a terminal that each single one of these would split into 10. So you'd have one, one hookup split into 10. I mean, if you think about that, you could power 10 devices on one input, or, or excuse me, two outputs on the power supply. That is pretty amazing. 
and it does it very easily and neat. And best of all, you can mount these anywhere you want because you can run the wire basically as long as you'd like. However, if you were going to run leads off this, I would highly recommend using 16 AWG. Once again, I'm using 20 AWG for certain light connectors. This is a light connector. You know, the Gecko doesn't really pull many amps, so we're not looking at a lot of heat here. We have to use common sense and, again, use the right wiring for the right type of job. However, when we get over here with switches, you can see, and I'm just using this for visual reference, I'm using the uh, silicone wire as well, wiring the switch. However, it's just for visualization. In real-world application, on a, on a home switch, I would always use shielded cable. But even that becomes much more simple. And why does it become simpler? Because we know that once we use our shielded cable, hooking one end here and one end here is by far easier than bridging two of these switches with 18.4 shielded cable. It's a pain. It's, it's thick cable and it's not real malleable and it just doesn't make sense. But if you're only wiring one switch at a time, connecting this is a joke. I mean, you can go in here, manipulate it instantly, and there you go. I mean, you can have everything connected in two seconds, and you're basically all set and troubleshoot a complete system in seconds. And here's the opposite end. Let's say you did not want to check one switch where we said in that one scenario, if we were checking a single switch, we would disconnect one here and one here where this is connected. If you wanted to disconnect the entire subsystem, all you would do is disconnect here and disconnect here, and all your switches are disconnected. So it's pretty neat. I mean, it's a pretty neat subsystem, and it will keep your system neat, organized, and best of all, if you ever have to troubleshoot, because you're alone, I'm assuming, you're your mechanic, you're your electrical engineer, uh, you're everything, machinist, you're trying to encompass a lot, and typically if you're doing this as a profession or looking to do this to make money, time is money. So any downtime is costly. What I'm teaching you right now will save you time, and that and hence saves you money. So, again, this I'm going to sell as a kit. I do have silicone wiring in a multiple of colors. I'm going to get that list on eBay. But this will be a complete kit. So you can do one, two, three, however many of these you want to buy as a kit. They will come as a complete kit so that you can build and do this yourself with whatever uh, electrical items you have with terminal blocks. Again, this will work. Again, this is a, a gecko terminal block. However, if you had a breakout board, it'll do the same thing. I utilize this same setup in my six axis system. If you guys go back to my six axis system on eBay, you'll see that I use the same setup except I used uh, uh, toolless terminal blocks. It's the same principle. I just use these that are toolless, and you can use the same format with the toolless ones. But the neatest part of this whole process is the fact that it's all simple. It's all simple and neat. And, it, I mean, wiring your system becomes a complete joke because then, again, you're not fighting any connections. You're not fighting troubleshooting. Everything is connected individually, which makes your subsystems that much easier to allocate when you do have an issue. So that's what we're always trying to do. And again, we're trying to do it right. Like I stated, and I'll, state it, I'll say it again, when you're wiring a home switch, the big thing you always want to do, whenever you wire anything attached to your chassis, always, always, always use shielded cable. Um, our chassis that are metal, and I'm talking to the guys that have metal chassis, I'm hoping I'm talking to everybody that's use, utilizing a metal chassis, but um, metal becomes an antenna. So whatever you attach to it just gets amplified, and you'll get noise, and you never want a false positive with these switches, or that's kind of pointless of having them. So you always want to have an earth ground. Now, I did cover a video on grounding your machine. I also covered a video on EMI, which is you know pretty much in the same video. It's, it covers a lot of information. These can instantly be turned into a ground block, okay? Simply, once again, remove these uh, standoffs, and again, the standoffs, these are nylon. Um, the height on these are 0.32 inches, so they're not real high. They're super small. You can even stack these. Um, if you wanted to stack them one on top of another, you can actually mount them. You can mount them over each other and make an over-under rail system so you can confine your space. But um, overall, if you wanted to make a ground block, it's very, very simple. You would simply unscrew the nylon standoffs, screw uh, these into your machine. You can either screw them in uh, from the top 
or you could screw them in. Again, it, there's so many different ways you can mount them. I mean, I'm just not going to go into a billion different ways, but you get the principle. You'd mount it to your machine. Once this is mounted to your machine, the easiest way to get an earth ground to your machine with multiple outputs, this is what's really cool about this. You mount this to your machine, you'd have multiple outputs. You simply would run this terminal instead of going to the Gecko's number one input. You'd run it to your wall outlet's third prong. That third middle pin on your wall outlet will give you an earth ground. And that that will ground out your entire machine. Then your chassis has an earth ground, and on top of that, you have a breakout terminal block that you can attach multiple items that you want to use that earth ground on on your chassis. So it's it's super it's super useful. And again, it just depends on what application you're using. Again, I I deal with uh, CNC controllers, but in electronics, this has huge amounts of uses. I mean, it's just it's tremendous. Cars use them, boats use them. We know we use them in the home, so. It, again, this hopefully this has been informative to you and, and it'll open up some ideas on top of the fact, I mean, the neatness of the wiring. I mean, I can't emphasize that enough. Typically, if you were running your home switches, you wouldn't run this, of course, directly to the switch. I mean, you can do that. I don't recommend it. What you would typically do is have like a port on your box, which would then connect to these two wires and your switch would be on the end of the table. Um, even if you did it that way, you can still see how simple it is to disconnect the port or just go through and, like I said, disconnect the whole subsystem, and you're done. I mean, it's, it's pretty self-explanatory, and once you get the gist of it, it's, it's pretty neat. And, again, you can use them in millions of different formats. So hopefully this video has been informative. If you guys have any questions or videos you'd like to see, again, I'm trying to cover as many videos as uh, on things that I get questions on. Um, but overall, I, I can't emphasize it enough. This, the applications for something like this is endless. It's more or less... I deal with CNC controllers and uh, wiring, and it can be quite tedious. So, again, the use in this, putting together a package that will do this and build a subsystem, it just made sense, so I did the video on it. But if you have a particular need that you're looking at, have a question, don't be afraid to shoot me a message. Uh, my name is Vince. I'm on eDealers Direct. Uh, I usually get back with you in a couple hours. So, other than that, take care. Have a great weekend, guys. Thank you.